Have you ever felt stuck, trapped um, in a cycle of bad behavior, um, unable to break free from a besetting sin, or just repeating the same responses over and over again to bad effect? I have. And I believe that um, the, the dilemma that we face as human beings is one that Paul clarifies very clearly in Romans chapter 7. Um, it turns out that the transition from Romans 7 to Romans 8 is a transition from life under the law to life in the spirit. And I believe it's a, it's a transition that God wants all of us to make, but it isn't always easy. We're going to find that in Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul describes very poignantly and powerfully what life under the law looks like and feels like. It ain't good. In fact, he ends chapter 7 by saying, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Um, life under the law is pretty miserable. Um, and yet in chapter 8, he invites us into the realm of grace where we can experience the righteousness of God and be free from what the Bible calls the law of sin and death. So the title of this, this message is From Law to Grace or Wretchedness to Righteousness. I think you're going to like it. I believe it's a very helpful diagram to help you understand God's design for living in freedom through walking in the Spirit with Jesus, with our identity in Him. So let's get started. So in the Bible... Um, we, we hear about something called the law of sin and death. And in brief, the law states that if you sin, then you die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Along A sort of a corollary of the law of sin and death is that if you do wrong, then you deserve punishment. And there's something deep in us that actually feels very satisfied when someone is caught who's done something wrong, when they get punished, we get a little burst of dopamine because under the law, we believe that people who do wrong deserve to be punished. And it's very powerful in us. Along with that is the feeling that when we fall short, when we fail to accomplish what we set our minds to or what we feel like we ought to do, the way we ought to be or how we ought to perform, then we are likely to feel shame. Now, shame is not like guilt. Guilt is about what we've done wrong. Shame is the feeling that we are wrong, that we're defective, that we're broken. We are not enough. And, and every day, um, we are likely to feel um, that sting of shame whenever we don't measure up. If I give a talk, in fact, even after the, I give this little uh, talk for, for the internet, I guarantee you, I'm going to feel a little shame that I didn't do a better job, that I forgot to say something important or spent too long on something. Shame is a natural part of life when we come to be aware that we have not measured up or that we've fallen short of the ideal. Along with shame, though, we're likely to feel condemnation. And when we feel condemned, we feel that we, we are um, unworthy of love, unworthy of acceptance. And condemnation can even make us feel like we're worthy of death. And when shame is strong in a person, and I've had my many moments of extreme shame, that's when we feel that we should be taken out of the equation that, that even those we love would be better off without us. We feel very much condemned to um, punishment and death. Well, the irony for me is that that not only does the law of sin and death say that sin will lead to death and wrongdoing lead to punishment, but it turns out that when we fall short of the idea, when we sin or do wrong and feel that shame and condemnation, it makes us feel bad about ourselves. So ironically, we are likely to go back to sin. Um, I work with people who are dealing with uh, issues with their weight. And so maybe they decide they're going to cut out sweets. And I've, I've been there, done that, decide, oh, I'm not going to eat anything with sugar in it. I'm going to do better. Turns out somebody brings a cake by or it's a birthday, whatever. And you think, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat it. And then in a weak moment, you eat a piece of cake 
And because you immediately feel shame and condemnation, you think, well, I've blown it. Might as well eat the whole cake. Um, this happens very frequently with, with men who struggle with pornography, that if they have a slip, they're likely to just dive into it. Same thing can happen with alcohol or drugs is that when we don't, when we feel ashamed or condemned, then we lose all tendency to, to treat ourselves with respect, tenderness and care. And that's when we become self-indulgent and self-destructive. So sin leads to death, which leads to more sin. Shame uh, leads to sin, which leads to more shame. And the loop can be interminable. It's terrible. And we can feel trapped in that cycle of, of sin and death, of wrongdoing and punishment, of falling short and feeling ashamed. And that's where we feel that wretched state where we just cannot seem to get out of it. In fact, uh, the Apostle, says, Apostle Paul says, though, that when we feel, uh, come into relationship with God, we agree with him about the law. We actually want to do the right thing. But it's at that point when we actually try to start doing what the law says that we end up really realizing what life under the law consigns us to. In other words, if we try to escape this loop uh, by trying harder, and believe me, there have been many things in my life where I've decided, oh, I'm done with sin. I, this time, I'm really going to do it. You can look back at my journals from my teenage years and realize whether I was struggling with um, sexual sin by virtue of my feelings about myself. And I would, you know, make promises to do better and try harder. But then in a, a moment of weakness or, or after a period of time, I would be back to that same sin. And I would feel even worse because I had made a promise to myself, a promise to God, maybe to another person, that I was going to do better. And yet, there I was again. In Romans 7, Paul says that it's as if there's a that the law of sin and death is so powerful that when I try to do better, there are forces at work that push me back into it. In, in fact, he says that the law is spiritual and I am not spiritual. And so for me to actually do what the law requires is ultimately impossible, that I am going to feel that deep sense that I will never measure up to what the law requires. And really, that's, I, uh, I've come to believe that, that the law is intended to bring us back to God, not to create um, human beings that perfectly perform the law and so can feel... Um, guiltless and shameless because they've actually gotten it right. No, the law helps us realize that we are dependent on God for um, for our right standing with him. And that under the old law, the only way to maintain communion with God was through sacrifice. That every um, year at the very minimum, they would they would make sacrifices to God to atone for that sin that was inevitable. And so our sin actually reminds us under the law that we need God to save us. Um, if we stop looking at our sin, if we stop acknowledging it, then we can slip into self-righteousness and believe that we are good enough under the law. And this is the problem of people who are highly religious, like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, because it's tempting to find your righteousness out of your own ability to measure up to the, the things in the law. And the only way we can do that is to just focus on externals because internally we are always going to fall short. We are always going to sin in our thoughts or lust or greed or self-pity. Um, so our only option is to, uh, only good option is to be aware of our sin and to feel um, that we need saving. So this is what we, we find in, in Romans 7, the dilemma of life under the law. And it's wretched. It's terrible. Well, fortunately, God had always planned for grace to enter the picture. Now, he was always, God, God has always been a God of grace and always a God of forgiveness and always giving, given a way to make things right with him through sacrifice, through um, service and prayer. But um, 
but it was never a full manifestation of God's design for life with him. It wasn't until Jesus came into the world that we actually see an embodiment of God's great grace and truth. In the, the book of John, um, the, the apostle John says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. Um, and he walked on the world and showed exactly what it looked like to live perfectly under the law. Um, Christ came, and the word Christ is same as the word Messiah. It has to do with the one who saves us, who is God's um, messenger of atonement and salvation. When Christ came and walked on the earth, he walked in righteousness. Where every human on the planet had walked in sin, this new man walked in righteousness. He never um, resisted his father's will, and he was able, because he was all God and all man, to live fully in concordance, fully um, in uh, in sympathy or with with, with accurate um, be, performance of the law. And so out of his righteousness, because he had the favor of God, because death and punishment and shame did not apply to him, he walked in life. And everywhere he went, you saw manifestations of life. You would see um, people being healed from all kinds of diseases, blind people being re re uh, regaining their sight, deaf people hearing, and even people who had already died, like Lazarus, who had been dead four days, brought back to life. Righteousness leads to life in the same way that sin leads to death. And everywhere where Jesus' life would come, he would also encourage righteousness. He would say to people, um, go and sin no more. And he would empower them to live a new way based on their experience of his grace. It was an amazing thing. But how do I get from law to grace? How do I escape this cycle of sin and death, of wrongdoing and punishment, of falling short in shame and that deep sense of condemnation? How do I get from law to grace? Well, the first thing that has to happen is I have to change my identity. Um, the Apostle Paul says that that under uh, that under the law, if I come into relationship with God and choose His way, He says it is no longer I who sin, uh, who do the sin, but the sin that dwells in me. In other words, He's saying something radical that seems very wrong in a way. He's saying that I like. My identity is no longer wrapped up in sin and death. Like if I do that sin, if I eat the cake or whatever it is that I am, am, am committed not to do, that is no longer me. That's not who I want to be. My new nature is to follow the law of God. And if I fall short of that, that's not who I am. Now, that seems really kind of pathetic, like you're not taking responsibility for be your behavior, Paul. Um but he, he's tapping in to a truth that we must recognize and embrace if we are to get out from under the law. And that is that God has invited us to move over from sin to grace. Our identity, that big red eye, now is centered in Christ. I am in him. The, the scripture says that, that we, we no longer live, but Christ lives in us, and we abide in him. Um, and that's where our introduction to grace comes, is by moving our, our sense of who we are from our humanity um, as sons and daughters of men and women who are humans to our, our identity as sons and, and daughters of God, as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happened because of the cross. The cross is the centerpiece of uh, human history. It is where the enemy, the enemy is designed for us to um, use sin and death to destroy the world, collides with God's redemptive plan, which is mind-blowing because what God did was to ask Jesus 
to go not from righteousness to life, not to ascend to heaven in his pure and unsullied, um, his pristine state, but rather to go um, through the cross, to take on the death, the punishment, the shame and the condemnation that belonged to all of us. Um, under the sin of Adam and Eve and the fall, God tells them that um, because of their sin, the, the ground would produce thorns, that a woman would give birth in pain. Um, and those that pain and that the thorns, the punishment and the shame, the condemnation that belonged to us actually fell on Jesus in those final hours that he was on the planet when he was scourged and uh, mocked, when he was beaten and ridiculed. And what we see is that God purposes through Jesus to let him as the innocent sufferer take our sin. In the old law, the sacrifices that were made needed to be pure and unblemished. They had to be innocent animals because to kill a, a guilty human would be justified under the law, but it would it would it wouldn't have any redemptive value because the person deserves to die. When an animal would die in a, a, a pure and innocent state, it actually had redemptive value and was able to be applied to the human. In the same way, if Jesus had sinned like all of us, his death would have simply been a manifestation of him getting what he deserved. But because Jesus deserved life and glory and honor, and yet he took our death, our punishment, shame, and condemnation, then he turned things around. Under the law of sin and death, things go clockwise. Uh, under grace, the clock gets turned around. It goes counterclockwise, counterintuitive. And through his willingness to embrace the cross, we actually also then can embrace the cross and go from our sin to life. Because he took what we deserved, we can receive what he deserved. It's the most amazing thing. If you imagine Jesus as your older brother and you're playing a game of Monopoly with him, if you've ever played Monopoly, you know you can get a card that says, go to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not collect 200, and you go right to jail. It's kind of law in the center of sin and death. When you sin, you get that go to jail card and you go right to death, punishment, shame, and condemnation. But if Jesus is your older brother, he has a get out of jail free card and he can allow you to, he can swap places with you. He can go to jail for you and you go free. It is amazing. Well, how do we get from, from one side to the other, from sin to righteousness, from law uh, being under the law to being under grace? It really has to do with confession, claiming the cross and its power for myself. We do that by confessing the, the belief that Jesus is the Lord, that he um, came and sacrificed himself, that he died for me, and that I can receive the results of that death myself. So I confess faith in Jesus. And when I do so, um, along with uh, baptism and um, confessing to others, it, it moves me over into that new identity. I claim my identity by faith in Christ, by grace. We are saved, not of ourselves, lest any should boast. So confession is how we how we make that transition. But here's the here's the interesting thing. Not only does it require God's grace for us to move from law to grace, but not only does it require his power and confession of faith to do that, but to stay under grace can be even more challenging. Well, why is that? Why would it not be easy? to stay in the life of righteousness uh, and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, I believe the reason is very simple. It's because we still have a sin nature. Even though everything has been made new, our identity is completely transformed. We have become beloved in Christ. There is still sin at work in us, like Paul says in Romans 7. And the weird thing is that the longer you have been 
under grace, the more you have grown to love Jesus and to love the, the law and to want to be all that God asks of you, when you do fall short, when you do wrong, or when you sin, every cell in your body feels as though you deserve to be beat up, to, to feel shame, to feel condemned. Because after all, I've been a Christian for 10 months, 10 years, 10 decades. You know, we, you know, the longer we go, the more it seems we should not sin. And so the temptation there is to go back into shame and condemnation. And when we do that, we we have to buy, we bypass our, our, our slide through the cross. We, we bypass what God has done and beat ourselves up trying to make some sort of amends for our wrongdoing. Now, it feels right. I feel like I should be punished because I know better. I should, shouldn't do that. But ironically, that keeps me in the loop and makes it where I have to try harder to gain back my standing in the righteousness and grace of God. No can do. In fact, we have to be able to realize that, that in God's eyes, if he has paid for us to go directly from sin to grace, and we, we feel compelled to beat ourselves up, what may be more offensive to God than our original our sin is our refusal to let God's provision of grace through Jesus be enough. In other words, if God, if Jesus has paid, can we add to the suffering by beating ourselves up? If I went out to eat with you for lunch and having a great meal, I go to the restroom during the meal, come back, we finish eating. I tell the waiter, we're ready for the check. And the waiter looks at you and winks and says to me, um, well, sir, it's okay. It's all been taken care of. And I'm like, well, I ate the food. I should pay for it because I don't like people taking care of me. Um, and the waiter again asserts, yeah, your buddy put it on his credit card. It's taken care of. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, well, no, I ate the food. I should pay for it. And I throw money down on the table. How are you going to feel? Well, if you wanted to bless me with a good meal and pay for my lunch and I refuse the gift and instead insist on paying myself, you're not going to be very happy. It's going to feel like an offense to you. And I've come to believe that when we try to pay for something that God has paid for with the blood, sweat, and tears of his own dear son, that that may be perhaps the most offensive thing that any of us on the planet can do. That we have to be willing to say, thank you and to go back over into life. Now, when we do, we're like that woman caught in adultery, where Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And it actually, if we can avoid that temptation to feel like garbage and to beat up on ourselves, we're actually in a better place to step back into righteousness, to find the power to care for ourselves in a way that reflects the love of God, the grace of God, and the gift of God, salvation. So what we can do, though, when we sin, the way we get back over through the cross is by dying to self and self-protection through confession. I'm a big believer that one of the quickest ways that you can avoid sitting in shame and condemnation is to pick up the phone, reach out, tell someone, confess your sin, um, and you will experience um, immediate relief from the shame because you've brought that sin into the light. Um, confession says that I will not keep any, anything inside of me that betrays my identity as a child of God. And so confession immediately gets us from, um, from sin to life. Um, by confessing our sins, uh, James, the brother of Jesus says in James chapter five, if we confess our faults one to another, pray for one another, we'll be healed. We'll, we'll get some healing so that we don't keep doing the same things over and over again. We uh, get healed and we get whole. So confession 
of faith in Jesus initially moves us over into life with Christ and confession of sin keeps us there. We confess first to ourselves, to God, and then to another human being to keep our hearts clear, to keep everything in the light and let nothing remain in the dark. So to wrap this up, um, I want to talk about how we stay in grace. And um, it's very similar to the first few steps of the 12-step journey uh, through Alcoholics Anonymous and other recovery uh, groups. So step one is admit wretchedness. In the 12 steps, it says we, we admitted we were powerless and that our lives had become unmanageable. So admitting, I just, I can't do it. I'm wretched. I, I, I give up. Um, and that's the last verse, the last couple of verses in Romans 7 say, um, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The, the final uh, sentence in Romans 7 says, thank God for Jesus. I thank God for Jesus Christ, because it is our coming to believe in a power greater than ourselves that we are able to escape the bondage to sin. Um, step two says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore our lives to sanity. And so for us as believers, that power, that higher power is Jesus himself. And we thank God for him because he is our ticket out of jail. So number three is that we identify with Christ. In the 12 steps, it says we made a decision to turn our life and will over the care of God. That's really how we identify with Christ is by surrendering our life to his, letting him be our source of life and well-being, um, claiming his death for us, um, saying that we trust him and trust God through Jesus Christ for our salvation. So we identify with Christ uh, by making a decision to turn our life and will over to him. Um, the next thing we do is to disidentify with sin. Now, disidentify is not a real word, but it has real meaning in this uh, teaching because it means that we separate our sin from our identity. And sin, it is no longer I, but sin that dwells in me. And so we choose to separate our identity from our sin. Did I do the thing? Yes, but that's not who I am. It's what I did. It's not who I am. When we think about our past, it's our history, not our identity. Our identity is firmly fixed in Christ if we belong to him. And so through confession, we say, this is not me. And in the 12 steps, we do a fearless moral inventory to actually put our sin out there so that it no longer holds a place in our close to our chest. It's no longer a part of who we are. It is what we've done, and we confess it freely and find freedom by saying, this is not who I wish to be. I disidentify with sin. Next, we get to reject condemnation. In the, in the 12 steps, step five is, the, is where we make that confession. And when you confess to another person, you actually see on their face the grace of God, and you can turn away from the condemnation that the enemy wants to give you in the face of your sin. You you let the enemy see your sin, and he's going to tell you straight where, where you should go, and he's going to condemn you. He's called the accuser of the brethren. But when you share your sin, when you confess to another, then you can reject the condemnation of the accuser and see on the face of your brother or sister the love and acceptance of God that sets us free from that law of sin and death. Finally, we want to receive life, joy, and peace. When we reject what we deserve, then we can receive what Jesus deserves. Because all that he has is ours in him. The Bible says, um, in Christ, all the promises of God are yes in him. Everything that that is Jesus by right is ours by aligning with him, identifying with him. And his righteousness gets ascribed to us. The Bible says we are we become the righteousness of God. We put off our old nature and put on our new nature. And it's a daily thing to to remind ourselves 
that um, even our righteousness is filthy rags, um, but the righteousness of Christ is a white robe that covers us, cleans us up, and allows us to be fully present to God day by day as we receive his power to live life and to live it to the full. Well, I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, don't let the enemy keep you trapped in sin and death. Don't let him keep you under the law because under the law, we all deserve death. We deserve to be punished and we should feel ashamed. But when we feel those things, we immediately look to Jesus. Psalm 34 verse 5 says, those who look to him um, are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. If I look down at myself, I feel ashamed because I'm inadequate. If I look to Jesus, my face is radiant because he is uh, glorious. When he endured the cross, the Bible says he despised the shame and he, he wouldn't let it stick to him. He was hung and naked in a shameful condition. He was being ridiculed and spit and tormented. But he didn't let the shame stick to him because he looked to his father to whom he entrusted his spirit. And he did it because of his love for the Father. We want to have that same love for God. We love his law, but we cannot do it without him. We need him every day. Well, I love you, and I hope this has been helpful. Um, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, at Paul Looney, and check out some other videos. Um, the one on shame and grace, I think, will also bless you. I love you. Bye.